And now, here's two guys that are allowed at the gun range with no pants. Aaron and Jonathan. Howdy, and welcome to episode 99 of In the Rabbit Hole's Urban Survival Podcast. In this episode, we got 99 problems, but farming ain't one. We're your hosts, Aaron. And Jason. And you are in the rabbit hole. Safe and sound. Whether you're already a crack shot or have never taken a bit of instruction in your life, we could all become better marksmen. Join the volunteers at Project Appleseed for a day or even a weekend of rifle instruction that is second to none. Find out where marksmanship meets history by connecting with the good folks at appleseedinfo.org or click on the Three Strikes of the Match banner under the We Support heading in the right-hand column of In the Rabbit Hole. Remember, your rifle isn't going to shoot itself. So impress your friends, impress your neighbors the next time you're at the range. And don't miss out on the chance to shoot for free and earn your Rifleman's Patch today. Okay, so we've got some quick housekeeping to do before we dive into the show today. Uh, And that is that I updated the podcast for the blog that actually transmits and manages the podcast itself. And something very strange that I'm still not 100% sure of exactly what is going on with that plugin happened. Um, It seems to have gotten sorted out. I'm still trying to dig into exactly what was going on. So for the people uh, that were trying to download episode 98 and having some problems about that, I'm very sorry, guys. I was trying to communicate with a lot of you on Facebook and figure out exactly what experience you were having so that I get it sorted out. And we were having a little bit of communication problems there. But uh, but I think we've got it sorted out. And then uh, dog fart again. Man, that dog is nasty. Uh, and I guess we'll have a uh, tactical Weimaraner update here shortly. And, oh, God, it just got my side of the room. <laughs> Shit. God. If I hadn't just let him out, I'd be really worried about him. I think he's rotten on the inside. I thought we had that removed. Ah, mm. uh, wow. Eyes are watering. So, uh, <laughs> where were we? What, were that? what were we talking about before the dog? Like, Wow. Okay, um, yeah, that's not the topic of the show today. The topic of the show, what the, I'm like totally distracted and thrown <laughs> off. Like I saw the look on your face, Jason, and I was just like, what the, <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, it's like a wall of Weimer. You know what, I'm, I'm going to stop there because <sighs> yeah. I'm not going to inflict that upon the listeners. <laughs> it's, Fair it's, enough, man. It's, so that's man. rough. Uh yeah, that was impressive. Uh, so I guess that go ahead, that leads us into the Tactical Weimaraner update. And if you are brand new to the show, the quick summary is the Tactical Weimaraner alert system, who is a 15-year-old Weimaraner. Uh, he's a rescue puppy, although he's not really a puppy in quite some time now. Uh, he's been my dog of 12 years. He had a very large surgery to remove a very large tumor that was about the size of a cantaloupe, maybe a little bit uh, somewhere between a cantaloupe and a grapefruit from his gut uh he's doing very well uh he has had his stitches and staples out and uh he's eating like a horse and uh he seems to be doing very well kind of acting like he never had surgery at all and uh actually we've he's now out of the cone of shame (laughs) which uh was a big blue and white collar that was kind of a soft version of the hard cone of shame you're used to looking at so he ran around looking like a big blue daisy (laughs) <laughs> it was only slightly emasculating for him. Um, and so, yeah. Sorry, man. He got rabbit broth, so he's cool. He has. And we have found, I have found a very good use because one of the things I've had to do since he lost a lot of weight, he actually looks like I've been uh, abusing him because he's so thin. Uh, you can see his hip bones and all of his ribs and everything. But he has since the surgery put on three pounds, which is impressive for a dog his age. And the secret was uh, with all the exciting rabbit production we've had going on on the farm uh i've been making large batches of rabbit rabbit broth and uh that's like 
chunked it up into some big cubes and uh, kind of cup sized cubes. And I've been putting that over his dog food. And uh, I'm pretty sure at this point, though, I have now spoiled him. And I'm pretty sure that he will be getting rabbit broth on his food for the rest of his days. Knowing him, he will not eat, he will not eat anymore. It's just like, no, nah, forget it. No, mm-hmm. sorry. Put some rabbit on that or, or just, you know, I'm just going to sit here. Because he does that. <laughs> While he's the- waiting. I mean, and we've only been doing this like, what, two weeks now. And when I put his food, I'll put two cups of food in his bowl. And he will literally, while I'm heating up the rabbit broth, He'll just lay down in front of his bowl and just stare at the bowl. Like, yeah, that's nice. <laughs> Put some stank on it. Put some rabbit stank on it. I ain't touching that. Uh, this kibble. This kibble is no good. Uh, although he's German. I don't know why I was using a French accent or a, a very half ass French accent. But um, I guess that's sort of the comedy portion of today's show and the, the update portion of the show today. And um, as you've kind of probably to- uh, been able to tell from the the intro uh we're actually not going to do a farm update today right right um because quite frankly there's nothing really Even that new. exciting and new on the farm we uh just kind of there now mm-hmm. with an awful lot of rabbits i think in total we have about i stopped counting but i think the last time i counted we have fi- we had 53 rabbits in total oh hey we do have a quick update now that i think about it i almost totally forgot this animal control Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, I forgot that. it's been, how, yeah. Animal, that? yeah. I know it's crazy. So animal control showed up to the farm. So, see, I I guess I lied. We do actually have a quick farm update, which is, um, the the farm is in the warehouse district, uh, just shy of downtown in downtown Houston, and uh, been there for for quite a while now. And uh, I guess it's been about a few years now. They started. Tearing down some of the older buildings in the area, and they've been throwing up townhouses. Uh-huh. If that sounds weird to people that are in, in areas where they have this thing called zoning, well, Houston doesn't <laughs> have anything rem- remotely resembling zoning. So you will see the weirdest things right next to each other. That It's always fun to see friends come down from the Northeast, and they're like, wow, this is just the most bizarre sense of planning. I'm like, yeah, we don't plan here. <laughs> So it gives us our charm, man. Exactly. Charm. And so I, you know, as soon as they started building these townhouses and we started on this uh, farming expedition that we're on, I was just like, man, I know animal control is going to show up at one point. Mm. And I actually thought it was going to because, because be because of the rooster. <laughs> the given. Yeah. The I obvi- mean, you, the, the, the obvious. Yeah. The it's white gonna, elephant in the room. Exactly. It's going to be that loud ass rooster, Randy. Mm-hmm. That the neighbors do not enjoy his serenading. But as it turns out, it actually had nothing to do with him. Uh, and Houston does have some rules around live, keeping livestock in the city. And yeah. uh, apparently, it's, somebody was telling me, I hadn't really been paying attention to local news, but somebody was telling me that there's actually been a lot of stuff going on in Houston lately about uh, them, uh, about people, more and more people trying to keep chickens. And there, a lot of people are really petitioning the city to lax the rules on chickens because as it is now, if you keep chickens, I think it's your coop has to be 100 feet from the nearest dwelling, dwelling basically. I mean, it gets a little more technical than that, but that's essentially the easy way to think of it. And uh, we're actually 130 feet from the from the nearest dwelling. So we are well over uh, what we need legally. And I mean, we, you and I both kind of researched this and really made sure because we're like, I mean, oh, we, yeah. we don't want to get into this and spend a bunch of money on building out this farm to then have... The city show up and be like, yeah, you got to tear all that down and get rid of it. Yeah, so, But we're good. So we did everything we keep. Uh, what were the, the other rule is so there's, there's kind of two in play here. You can only keep, what is it, 20 of one particular animal? It's, the rule is it's 40 total animals. Right. Only 30 of in, one individual species. T- yeah, species. Yeah. That, okay. That's why we, you know. You keep up with that information. I just sort of like, <laughs> how many are we supposed to get rid of this time? Um, but so we've done, we've been pretty diligent in keeping our numbers oh, yeah. well below that. Because we just, we knew. They're going to, sh- you know, one of these new neighbors is going to yeah. show up and be like, they got chickens and bunnies. And it's like, ah. So animal control showed up. Uh, you said, yeah, I'd like to, you know, talk to you about your, uh, your chickens and your bunnies. And I'm like, okay. Uh, and I immediately jumped in. Yeah, we're very aware of the rules. Uh, we keep our, our both 
chickens and rabbits below the total number of adults we're allowed to keep. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do not have uh, the maximum number for any of either of the animals. There and standing. And I also explained to him as we were walking out to the farm, because it is kind of a track from the front door of the building that he entered out to the farm. And basically saying, explained, you know, we, we clean it every five, five to six days. Uh, we very diligent about caring for the animals and kind of explain to him why we were doing it. Not so much focusing on the survival part, more focusing on kind of the humane part of responsible food that I'm eating and understand where it comes from and all that. And that is definitely part of it. And of course, as listeners of a survival show, you also understand there's a survival implication to it as well. That I didn't share with him because, you know, we got enough problems. Right. Animal control has showed up. So we talked for a bit and he finally got around to explaining what the deal was. And we had this one very large cage made as kind of a, a holding cage for chickens. Uh, when we Last year when we were... Ramp uh, that production up. Do, ramping up production and adding a few, few new hens, which ended up being mostly roosters. Uh, but they were tasty. Yes, very uh, and so then we kind of cleaned the cage down. And since we've been in high production with rabbits, we cleaned the cage down. And we've now been using that cage to house all these rabbits while we're waiting on them to mature. Because we have new babies being born. And we have old babies that got to come out of the cage with the mama. And they got to go doing, into a holding pen, essentially, or holding cage, while we wait for them to mature enough. And for us to have the time to actually pull 20 rabbits. Which is becoming... We have to schedule it now. Yeah, we really do. Uh, we were talking about that yesterday. And so uh, so anyway, he expressed that, uh, that uh, we didn't, somebody was concerned because we didn't have enough plastic pads down in the, in the rabbit's cage. And I was like, well, and he's like, now there's actually no co code or ordinance around it. He's like, so he's like, and to be frank, he's like, actually, I'd like to shake your hand because this is the nicest, most amazing setup I've ever seen. Uh, in any of my stuff. And he and I chatted for a while and he's like, you guys are doing an amazing job here. This place is really clean. And I was like, that's actually really funny because you are coming here on the day before <laughs> we clean. So the, it's actually the dirtiest it is throughout the week. And he's like, wow. He's like, this is just so nice and everything. He's like, you know what? I'm, I'm going to write this up as a note in your file. And, you know, you guys should never, ever see us again because y'all are well way within your, your legal limits of 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 all of the rules, you're you're cognizant of them, and you're keeping this place really clean and doing, you know, just a really nice job here and everything. And all these animals look really well cared for and really happy. And I was like, yeah, they are. They petted three times a day, and they get oats in the morning, and hell in the evening. And yeah, we're coddling them. It's okay, <laughs> we're coddling them. Um, but you know, I mean, that's part of it. Is you know, it's showing these animals that we have a real appreciation for them, because ultimately. They are going to, you know, get hit over the head with a pipe and go into a crock pot or a pressure cooker. Yes. Yeah. It's not a pretty experience. It's not a fun experience. And as Florida Hillbilly of FloridaHillbilly.com expressed, yeah, it's like you lose a little bit of your soul every time you do it. Who we were actually going to have on the show today, but then we were like, no, we're not going to have a farm update. So we're going to give him, we're not going to harass him this weekend to come on the show. So, uh, so Florida Hillbilly, we will get with you and schedule for the next show. And uh, go over some of our previous blunders and talk about all that fun stuff. But so that was the, to get back to it, that was the end result with animal control. They were just like, yeah, you know, if you wouldn't mind just throwing in a few extra the plastic mats into the, the rabbit's cage. The, the person was concerned about the rabbit's feet. And I was like, these aren't cheap pet store rabbits and rabbits. They have very thick pads, very thick fur on their, their, uh, their paws. Mm -hmm. They're, they're good. These, these animals are not out. And I was like, trust me, we're very cognizant of him and pay close attention. Yeah, I know. You just, if you wouldn't mind, and it, it was funny because he ended up, if you wouldn't mind doing it, it would really help so that this person, um, and it was funny, you started watching him choose his words carefully. He's like, just so that this person, um, that, you know, doesn't call us anymore. Like, I got it. I got it. He's like, but you shouldn't see us. Anymore. So that was that was exciting and that was nice and that was really reassuring actually. I think that was a big very, part of it. That was you know, that somebody from animal control was like, Let me shake your hand. This is really nice. Which also led me to believe, you know, maybe we really are coddling the crap out of these. Yeah, more oats for everybody. So anyway, <laughs> but I did stop giving the rabbits toys. Thank God. 
<laughs> They're already fat enough as it is, man. You know, <clears throat> some of those rabbits need treadmills. We might, uh, we might uh, be overfeeding a few of them. Yeah, they um, just look so hungry. Dude, I'm probably more guilty of it than you are. Well, the problem is every time we go out there, they see sucker written on both of us. <laughs> you're like, like, he doesn't feed me. And you're like, oh, you need some more oats. Rabbit's like, yeah, I'm starving. As they're like, guts hanging out. <laughs> that's just Bobo the fuck. I'm... But anyway, so that is that is the farm update for this week. That uh, So apparently we did have one after all. Um, but today's show is, as we said, not going to be about the farm. It is going to actually be a survival chi show mm. and if you're new to the show and don't know what survival chi is might i recommend that uh before or after this episode you go check out episode 43 or episode 12 for the original the very original survival chi and it's probably best to actually listen to both of them We've covered some slightly different versions of survival chi and some different takes and angles and things in both episodes and I'm not going to go into what it is today. And if you're like, hey, it's not showing up on my iTunes feed, you can go directly to the website. Go hunt down episode 43 or episode 12. And there's a download link uh, in both of those episodes, just as there is in every episode post on the website. And uh, download them for free. Or, you know, you can buy the first season and uh, help support the show and uh, get it that way. It's up to you. Totally up to you. Um, but how this centers in with Survival Chi today is this is actually the... Uh, an intelligence show, so to speak. And it's, you know, I usually don't get too excited, which you rag on me all the time about, Jeff, <laughs> but I don't get excited enough about some of my own ideas sometimes. And it's going to sound like I'm I'm stroking my e my own ego a little bit today, but but I am actually a little excited over this idea, partially because there was a lot of pain involved in this idea that that I I, I work for a boss that sometimes can be rather demanding. And um, he had this thing, and for like almost two years, he kept yelling at all of the senior staff, all the executive staff that works for him, and it was like, I need you guys to really own this, and da da da. And it's like, and we would all kind of look at each other and be like, what does that really mean? And you'd ask him, and he'd be like, figure it out. What do I pay you people for? Um, actually, I don't think he ever actually did that part, but, but anyway, and so it took me a long time to really figure it out. And then, one night, we, he and I were hanging out more on a personal level, just hanging out, being cool, and he was talking about it, and I finally got him to really kind of open it up, and I was like, oh, and then as I started to get it, I was like, oh, this is brilliant, and it started to come to me, and I was like, this is like a whole system for life, and this is a whole system. I mean, now that I really understand what he meant, and so from there, I actually broke it down into a system. And what I am generally really bad about is I will come up with an idea that is actually a good idea and not just me over-engineering the crap out of something. And then as soon as I've come up with it, I'm like, okay, I got it. I understand it. And then I kind of forget about it. Yeah, it drives me insane. Man. It drives you bananas. And you look at me like, dude, that was some great stuff. How are you not like, you know, breaking sharing your, that. Yeah. sharing that? Or, and so, so here we are. And this one, I actually do feel good about it. And now that we've built it up and built it up, what it is. So... What does it mean to own something is kind of what the concept is. And like I said, that drove me nuts for two years that somebody was saying own something. And it's a, a, a way of saying basically, you know, to take responsibility for something and then to take action on that something to achieve your desired outcome. And so what I've done is I've broken that down into basically a nine step system. And the trick here is, is that this is a really great system, whether we're talking about planning and figuring out survival strategies for just getting started or whether you've been in it for a long time and you want to really kind of redefine your goals and rethink about things and really tighten up your preps. Um, and it's also if, you know, you're stuck in a really bad dramatic situation, uh, you know, zombie apocalypse tomorrow, this is a great way of thinking through what you need to do when you need to do it, why you need to do it, which is actually incredibly important mm. and uh, ultimately getting the result that you're looking for. Um, and so with that said, I, we'll just run through the nine steps real fast so that you kind of get a sense of what we're doing as we get in and really dive into it. And the first step is to identify and define the problem. And the second step is to then identify and, divine, identify and define the cause or causes. And then the third step is identify and define what will happen if the problem is not fixed. And then the fourth step is to state what you are going to do to fix it. 
um, and that is essentially what is the solution? And that's kind of the big picture solution. And I'm trying really hard not to crack up while Jason is dying of, and I, I'm trying not to breathe through my nose at this point. That's just wow. Okay. Yeah, as you read those, I'm like, we need to take this out of his diet. <laughs> So that was the comedic interrupt, the, the uh, what is it, uh, comedy relief in what was getting to be a very serious topic. All right. <sighs> Sorry. So jump back on here while I breathe through my mouth. <clears throat> so going back and restating what number four was, number four is state what you are going, state what you are going to do to fix it, i.e., what is the big, high-level, single-statement solution to the problem? And then the, the fifth is to actually go through, once you've defined what you're going to do, is to define the individual tasks needed to complete the solution or solutions if there's many causes involved. Um, and then the sixth step is to give a time frame in which each task will be completed in. Uh, and then the seventh step is sort of an optional step if there's more people involved or if you've been able to harangue more people into the, the, uh, the, the work that you're doing here, and that is to assign tasks to others. Step number eight is to then follow up with everyone. And then if this is more of a workplace environment um, or even in a survival situation, it is to, once all this is done, to report back and give a summary and talk through what has happened. And that, I mean, we're not talking about that doesn't have to be a lengthy conversation. It can be a lengthy conversation. That might be good, but it doesn't have to be. That's, an, <clears throat> that's important just to have the full circle of communication. Yeah, it really is. And right. I think then that, you know, and that kind of touches on the, the C part of survival gene, mm -hmm. which is community. And, and we're going to really get into that as far as talking about, you know, and I think in any collaboration I've ever been involved in, communication is the one thing that as soon as you add more than one person just screws everything up. And it's not a sense of too many chefs in the stew. A lot of it is just that it's really not that. It's really that people just in general and that you and I were actually up very late last night working on some of, some of our personal goals and some of our personal just just life, life planning and yeah. doing that, which is kind of a new thing you and I are doing. And we're calling it our weekly mastermind session where you and I sit to get sit down together as friends of 18 uh, or 20 years or however long it's been. I don't even want to think about that because that just means, wow, we're getting old. But uh, but sitting down and really trying to, you know, help each other on with our own personal goal setting and all of that stuff. And uh, we were, of course, you know, we cackle like a couple old hens when we get together. <laughs> so so we were up till three o'clock in the morning and driving my girlfriend Jennifer nuts, which led to us set like closing two sets of doors. Y'all are too loud. What? 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 It's three o'clock in the morning. What do you mean? <laughs> we're too loud. Um, anyway, uh, neither here nor there. But, the, you know, the the sense of communication, that really is super key. As soon as you get more than one person involved in it, because even you and I have been in the middle of stuff. And you'll say stuff to me or I'll say stuff to you and we kind of think we have an understanding of what the other person's saying. Or sometimes you're talking and I have no idea what the hell you're talking about. Or sometimes I'm talking and you're just like, dude, I, what are you talking about? <laughs> Where are you going with that? Why are we having a physics conversation when we were talking about music? Uh, we're, we're here working on rabbits. What is this all about, man? Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I can get out there in left field. From, from time to time, I'm, I'm fully well uh, aware of that. And and you speak in half sentences, which is yes. a little frustrating for me sometimes. <laughs> uh, and your text messages are like, hey, man, I'm, I'm really quick and to the point. <laughs> one word does not a conversation make, uh, a coherent conversation make. Anyway, uh, so anyway, so to dive into it, uh, let, let's let's, you know, let's take it from the top. Number one is, you know, identifying and defining the problem. and Here's the thing, if you cannot clearly define the problem, if you cannot wrap it down to one sentence or two sentences maximum, then how effective could you possibly be at addressing the problem? Um, you know, there's, there's the old expression of, you know, people running around like a chicken with their head cut off. And I think what that really usually is, is people don't know where to start first with a lot of things, especially if we're in like panic mode and we're trying to do something fast. And oh, it's, yeah. Um, you know, and it's really funny. There's a, there's another really old expression, and I love really old expressions, obviously. But uh, one day, as teenagers, a friend of mine and I thought it would be really funny to go uh, test drive used Porsches. Um, of course, there was no way in God's green earth or either of our parents were going to to go for these shenanigans. 
But the salesman was was obviously somehow uh, of the illusion that that we might actually possibly be customers. So he took us out, and he was you know what you'd think of of like a of a, a sports car, like high end sports car. I mean, you know, he had the cool hair and the cufflinks and the pinky ring, and a uh, very slick guy. And it was a really interesting statement. It was, uh, and and I've heard since heard it said a lot by uh, a lot of different shooting instructors, which is that. Slow is smooth, smooth is fast. And it's the same thing with planning. A lot of people don't want to stop and do the planning. They want to react and they want to run around like a chicken with their head cut off. And there's the tie back in if you're wondering where I was going with this. Um, but it's actually more efficient a lot of times to actually stop, think through things, do some planning, and then go with a clear sense of what you're trying to do so that you are actually effective. And, and, that in, and in that sense, you don't waste time doing stupid crap mm -hmm. and you actually get things done. Um, and you cannot do any of that if you don't actually understand what the problem is. And going back to the communication part, if you can wrap down what the problem is in a single sentence, or even if you have to in two sentences, that makes it extremely easy for you to communicate with someone else. And it really, as you wrap it down and define it into this tight, neat little package, it helps you really understand in full, no one's in, in full and certain terms, what the problem really is. And then from there, you can go down into number two, which is to then identify the cause or causes uh, of what the issue is. If you can't identify the causes, you are very well likely to only end up addressing the symptoms and not any of the causes. And if you're only addressing the symptoms, then the issue itself will persist, most likely. It may go away for, for the time being. Yeah. You, you may know, have an immediate temporary. sense of alleviating whatever your pain is. Exactly. But, uh, and pain being anything that is not, you know, making you jump for joy is the way is whenever you hear, uh, I'm bad about saying, constantly saying the word pain and people are like, physical pain, emotional pain. And I'm like, no, just pain is anything that you're not jumping for joy. You, you have some un, unfulfilled desire, want, need, uh, or it could be physical or emotional. Because that is where pain comes from. Anyway. Um, so, and by also identifying the causes and really thinking them through, you may see ones that you didn't see before uh, if you were just trying to go really fast. Uh, when the other thing is, you may very well also open up additional solutions that you would have never thought of before if you hadn't actually sat down and started going through uh, some sort of proper process. And then the third one is to we said before, define what will happen if the problem is not fixed. And that, to a lot of people, probably sounds like a weird one. Like, why do I really need to worry about what will happen if we don't fix the problem? And there's two things. If you do not figure out what will happen and clearly define what will happen if the problem is not fixed, you will not feel as much of a sense of urgency to do something uh, if it is not the sky is falling to get something done. And it is a way of motivating yourself to do something. Going back to the communication part of how this works is if you can tightly wrap and identify what will happen if you do not fix the problem, that makes it easy for you to communicate the importance to someone else. And this is, this is kind of a big thing in the prepper community in, in general. I mean, this is a question we get all the time. And this is a question I see, I've seen come up for, for years and years and years and years. Uh, which is people always saying, how do I get somebody else into prep? Well, how can you convince anyone of anything if you cannot point out in very simple, short terms, why it's a problem? What will end up happening to them if they don't do it? To move on to, now that we've addressed what will happen if you don't fix the problem and you've communicated that to others if there are others involved, number four is to state what you're going to do to fix it. So what is the solution? Uh, this is your plan of action, and, and this is not the detailed plan of action. This is just the one or two sentences uh, that you use to tightly define what you're going to do to fix it. Um, and that could be, the sky's falling. Okay, we need to get to cover. Mm. And it would be something that simple. Now there would be all these tasks involved, like run, quick, uh, <laughs> duck and cover, roll, I don't know, bob, weave, parry, something like that. Uh, those could be the tasks involved. But, uh, but essentially, at first, you need to identify you know, what is the overall big overarching idea of what needs to get done, which in that joking case would have been, we need to get to cover. 
Um, or in this case, we need to get the a cork for the dogs, but <laughs> it just continues over here. So the, uh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Distracted again by the thought, man, I, I don't even know if we're going to make it through this show today. <laughs> <coughs> so, oh, all right. Yeah. So now, now that you, once you've been able to clearly define and ratchet it down on what is it, now you have a very clear understanding of what the big overarching idea is that, that needs to be accomplished here and going back to communication again. I mean, and, and I know this is going to start to sound repetitive. It probably are, has already started to sound repetitive. Jason's shaking his head. You're like, yeah, it kind of does. And that's because I really want to drive it home that this is very important for communication. The simpler and shorter and more direct statement you can make to anybody about anything, the more likely they are to be able to understand what it is you want and actually act upon it um, and not get caught up and confused by the details. And now that we've said that, let's get caught up in some details, which is number five. And that is to start defining the, ta the individual tasks. And so while the big picture is very important, uh, you do, of course, have to have a very clear understanding of all the little pieces and parts and how they come together to actually do the big picture. Um, and again, that allows you to also communicate them to others. There we go for the repetition part of the show. And that will just continue. And that can be a very short list. That can be a very long list. as uh, as like. Jason and you and I were up last night and we were, we were working through some of our own personal goals, trying to do some things and some things that uh, you and I were both talking through some of things just were like, they really just needed like three items mm -hmm. on there. It was like, okay, I need to set this up and I need to do this. And then that whole process takes seven minutes, but it was still like a big deal that it actually needed to be done. Yes, exactly. Um, and then there were other things where it was like, there were 15 tasks involved and, and we're talking and it needed to happen over the course of two weeks. Right. Um, and it, so it just, it really depends on, it depends on the situation. It depends on what you're trying to do. And, you know, and it depends on, I guess, also your patience level of how much <laughs> and how CD you are and how willing you are to really sit there and kind of work through what are all the little pieces and parts. And here's an interesting thing. And it's kind of a concept that, that Jason, you and I were playing with a couple of weeks ago, which is the concept of 360 degree thinking, yes. which is 180 degree thinking is is a very eloquent way of saying you're not just you're not thinking past your own nose you're not thinking about anything beyond your own skin you're not thinking about anybody but yourself or anything but yourself whereas 360 degree thinking is you're starting to think through like not just yourself but also how does this affect others how does this affect the environment around me and by environment i don't necessarily mean like polar bears and 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 plastic and baby seals and stuff like that i mean it's like i mean just your everything. sphere of influence your sphere of influence exactly and what your what impact you have on everything around you and by working through those tasks you start to see, more clearly see uh both the 180 degrees and also the 360 degrees so you see in front of you you see and behind you you see out to the sides and you have a clear you start to begin having a, a clearer scope of what's going on and what will happen based on those tasks yeah, and i can't emphasize the importance of that i mean don't don't get me wrong it's, it's a monumental pain in the ass oh pardon my french yeah I mean, when we were working on this thing last night, you know, it's two o'clock in the morning. We're both sober, um, at least by this point. It took us an hour and a half just, you know, or it took me an hour and a half just to get down, you know, my one little, my, my sphere of influence. Yeah. I could not believe how long it took me to do that. Mm -hmm. But it was that process that we're, that we're talking about, you know, working through each one of them slowly and actually thinking about it and putting an actual thought process to it. <clears throat> you start seeing all the, the different minute details that you wouldn't have seen before mm -hmm. case in point we were you know, breaking it down onto a, uh, on an actual time scale yeah How, i mean you know all of us typically just want to look at you know right in front of us and you know, think okay this is what all i have to do today well but you've got all this other stuff going on behind you know behind the scenes behind you uh, i.e the 360 mm -hmm. that you're not thinking about you know well, what about this goal that i was you know i wanted to achieve this week so on and so forth and you start breaking it down on, on the timetable wise mm -hmm. uh, during an entire week. And all of a sudden you realize, damn, man, I've only got 10 hours. Yeah, that was an interesting you know. thing. And that was because of all the tasks involved. Because the big overarching goal, you can't really put that on a calendar. And you can't really plan around that without figuring out what the tasks are involved. And then figuring, and I mean, this is the next step we'll come to is mm -hmm. figuring out about time. But um a nice way to lead into the conversation about time is for what you and I were doing. I literally sat down and was like, okay, there's 160 hours 
in a week. Those are those are physically all the hours that you have to do anything in a week. Um, and then it was like, and one of my goals was to actually start sleeping a reasonable amount. Um, cause usually I have a bad habit of only getting like four or five hours of sleep a night and then, you know, walking around going, why am I so tired? Um, and I act, I am somebody that really needs about seven, seven, at least seven hours of sleep, eight hours of sleep. And if I can do eight hours of sleep for like a week, it is amazing how much more supercharged I am to be able to get things done a lot faster. And so it's, yeah, I slept more. But I was actually the time I ended up having while I was awake was that much more productive. So for me, it works. Some people, I mean, I do know, uh, like you and I have a friend, Sergio. I think the dude sleeps like four hours a day and he like just bounces off the walls when yeah. he's awake. And you're just like, I, I hate you die. Yes. Where do, where do you get this energy? And, you know, and he's just this <laughs> spunky little Latin dude. And he's always going and going and going and going. And you're just like, how do you, how, you, you don't sleep, man. You're just a jerk. But, and it was, so we broke it down and it was like, all right. And it was funny because you and I went 56 hours a week. That's actually, wait a minute, let me calculate that. Holy crap, that's a third of my week. And it was really, and I mean, this was just a simple spreadsheet of how many hours are you actually going to dedicate to different things? Right? There's this many hours, 56 hours, gone to sleep. 40 hour work week for, for one job. Mm -hmm. And it was like, all right, take off 40 hours there. All right, I need it. And we're going through all these things and I'm like, well, of course I'm tired all the time. And of course, like, I feel like I'm not getting certain things done because there aren't actually that many hours in a week. Mm -hmm. And I found myself like, all right, well, um, I need to cut out some entertainment time and I need to trim this here and there. And maybe I need to shut off my personal email during the week and, and just dedicate like a little chunk of time on the weekends to actually run through because if something's that really that important from you know, one of my friends, they'll just text me. Mm -hmm. Um, and something I did a long time ago, which is I actually, I only go to Facebook to actually check the, in the rabbit hole page. I do not go to Facebook to, to actually look at my own personal page. Uh, the, the time part of this becomes very important, um, because you do have to have an understanding of how long anything is going to take you. And you also, and in part of that, I guess part of it that, that we haven't really talked about yet is define is, is then coming to an understanding of is what you're trying to do realistic and is it even achievable? Um, which was a whole nother concept that we're not going to get into today about what you and I were talking about. Cause you and I were going into some like really deep philosophical time management stuff. But anyway, but so this comes to the, the sixth step, which is to give a time frame with each task and figure out, you know, when and define, you know, when are you going to complete it by? Not just how much time is it going to take you, but when are you going to complete it by? And that also gives a sense of urgency to anything, anything you're doing and a clear understanding. Um, because some people are like super organized. And just somehow, magically, I still don't believe it. I think they're lying and actually do secretly keep calendars, but uh, somehow manage to just kind of get stuff done. And it always gets done on time. They're like, oh, no, it's a breeze. Uh, I don't know. I can't work that way. I actually have to put stuff down because I have to know when am I going to do it? And because uh, otherwise I'll stuff, I will stuff it up. And I, and I think you, I know you, Jason, you're the same way. We'll back that sucker right up until the very oh, last minute. Hell yeah. And, and then it's just like, wow, okay, I've got 45 minutes to do something that is going to, that really should take me three hours. And the end result is that you actually don't do it as well as you could have done had you actually dedicated the appropriate time. And I, was, I know plenty of people, and I was one of those people too, that said, well, you know, I like putting myself under pressure because then I really get it done. And my answer to those people is usually great. Schedule three hours, put yourself on, if, if you really feel like you work better that way, then put yourself on a time constraint and say, I've given myself three hours, but man, I'm going to try to get it done in 45 minutes. Um, and after those 45 minutes are up, see if you really got as far as you thought you were going to get and, you know, really step back and think, you know, could I actually make it that much better by spending the full amount of time on it? And that's always my answer to people that are like, no, I like to do everything last minute and stay up all night because then I do my best work and I get it done. And I'm like, no, you don't. I work with those few yeah. people. I'm like, no, you don't. Your work sucks. I don't know yeah. what you're thinking. <laughs> that was, that's always been my philosophy. And now that I've been like looking back, I'm like, ooh, that kind of sucked ass. Yeah. Going, going back to the communication, um, you know, if you can define the time and when it needs to happen by, that goes back to being able to the, the community part of this discussion, which is being able to then clearly define to others how long it's going to take something to be done. And if they're somebody that is involved in the project they'll have a clear scope of when things are going to be get get done by because especially if 
they're involved in the project, then they'll have a sense of when their things need to be done by, and they'll be able to plan accordingly. Or conversely, uh, we can, you know, then move on to number six, which is assigning tasks to others as needed. If you cl- if you clearly state how long it's going to take and when it needs to be done by, it's then something that you can clearly communicate to somebody else. I need you to do this. It's going to take about, you have this long to do it in. It has to be done in this amount of time. Now, usually with working with other people, I also like to then give them the, the pain aspect of this will is what's going to happen if you don't get that done. Um, cause it, it, it's magic. It helps light a fire on other people's butts and mm-hmm. to get things done. Um, and it's, you know, and in a lot of ways, if, whether, if we're talking about it in just a personal life situation, uh, as far as like work goes or even personal home life of getting things done, it's like, that's a, there's no way anybody can come back and say, well, you know, you did it. And it's like, no, it's all on you. You knew what you were supposed to do when you were supposed to do it by how long it was going to take and when we needed to buy. It, and you knew what would happen if it did not happen. And that's really kind of hard to refute, uh, for anybody else. And that's, you know, and that's not really the goal there. The goal there is to be an effective communicator in this instance. Uh, you know, going back to the biggest problem in any kind of collaborative group is actually a clear line of communication. Um, and, and clear, and really, I think what that really boils down to are a clear understanding of what expectations are for people. Um, so that people aren't just like, well, I thought you meant this, or I thought you needed it by this time. Um, I kind of assumed, you know, you're not leaving any room for assumption here is kind of a, a big takeaway for it. Um, and I think with that, the <clears throat> the number eight is, you know, w- again, whether we were talking about like everyday mundane life kind of working in an office setting uh, or whether we're talking about in a survival situation where you've given someone else something to do or you've you've got something for yourself to do, which is just follow up on it. You know, have have a clear set time. OK, it was supposed to be done in this amount of time at this date and then you go back and you look at it because again this is you are taking ownership of whatever this this situation and this issue is so you're following back up and making sure that it got done and because one of the things i've found is i'll in work i'll give people tasks to do and i'll give them deadlines and everything else and uh well it's just kind of a fact lie some people are flakes Mm. um i had somebody that works for me and i'd given them a project and in part, it was my own fault because I wasn't taking full ownership of it. And I went and checked in on her and realized she had not been working on that project for three months. Oh. Yeah. And I was just like, A, I was mad at myself. I was like, how did I let this go this long without looking at it? And B, how did this person? And I went and I kind of was like, hey, what happened? And they tried to give me this BS story. And I kind of took it back. Nope. I told you. This was the way it needed to be done. And you don't really have any excuses. You're just sitting here bullshitting me. And we finally got to the root of it. Um, I can be kind of a blunt person at work. And so that's, you know, where you come in. And, and while what she was doing was not necessarily that important of a project, and certainly no one was going to be harmed or injured by that project not being completed from a survival situation, you know, that could very easily be, that could have easily been the linchpin that wrecked the entire thing and caused somebody to get hurt or worse. Um, and, and everything else. And we are going to go back as we're coming to the tail end is we are going to start working through these, like some examples and we'll, we'll tr- we're going to come up with some examples on the fly of, you know, what scenarios we could talk about in doing this. Oh yeah. We'll actually r- r- roll back and be like, the reason why we're going through this in such detail is because you need to plan <laughs> to plan. You need to practice. <laughs> yeah. You practice so that you can plan in the survival situation. You just generally don't have the time to, you know, sit down, pull out a notebook, Write all this stuff down. You need to have already gone through these scenarios a couple of times. Run through it, you know, once or twice with your team. Yeah. And understand that, you know, this is what, okay, here's the scenario. This is what we do. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So that, there, you know, when that situation does pop up, you've already planned. You've already made, you know, d- done a couple of run throughs and figured out, you know, the small nuances yeah. of the situation. And, you know, that plan can be you know, operated, you know, autonomously. So, one of your teammates isn't there you can still handle all the different pieces yeah and it's the more you practice it's just like firearms yeah. martial arts anything else, anything else. The, the, your worst day of training is, is is going to end up being what happened mm-hmm. and i think that's the real key takeaway I and mean, it's for anything in life if you're not actually practicing you're not going to just watch a five minute video on uh what was it there's a really funny commercial on where the guy's like put the striking power of a firearm in your hands and i'm like that's entertaining marketing but and it's like, go to my website and get, you know, watch a five minute video and you're going to be a total badass. And I'm like, 
God, this is this is this is the kind of marketing that I, that that makes me feel bad about being in marketing. But <laughs> but anyway, I, I, I mean, the guy's program could be really good. I have no idea. I just can't stand the commercial. But anyway, it's uh, it is that sense of that you can't just watch something one time, and you can't just run through something one time. It, it does actually have to be uh, practiced. And you know, I think going on to the final step of in, in really talking through, you know, reporting back and doing a summary. You know, and that's that's why the military has after action reports. Mm-hmm. You know, and that's why like Project Appleseed, uh, the instructors have action app or, uh, after action reports where they really will go on the forums and 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 in most groups uh, in real organized groups I've ever been in that are successful, they do sit down and after every every kind of event, every everything, they sit back and they they review what happened afterwards, and it's a nice way of others and understanding what all took place, what the end result was, and addressing any issues that may may have occurred from it and learning from those issues you have let's say you have five people in a group and and you're in charge and you're the leader and you've been doling out tasks and doing all this stuff and you've been doing this great job of communicating and everything else well if you don't pull everybody together afterwards and really communicate the project over everybody did a great job you know but we had these few little hickeys here and and next time as a group we need to do a b and c well then you've fallen back on not communicating with the crap and not sharing with the group what all went right, what all went wrong, and what can be learned from it. Um, and, you know, I think it's just as important for the person doing these steps uh, and running, basically taking ownership of whatever it is, which is the topic of the show today, is, you know, owning survival, but it's owning any situation, really, um, is that idea that when you do kind of go back over and you do do a summary and kind of the fog of war, or, or the we'll call it the fog of the situation, has kind of lifted and you've had a chance to really think about things that's new information you can use going forward for the next time anything even remotely similar happens again or even if it's just you know drawing an analogy the next time you do anything and you're like well this one time we did it this way and while they're not actually related in very general terms they are actually related as far as workflow so what you know we we talked about that for a second and we did talk about we do some examples and since you and I actually didn't make up any examples we're gonna, we're going to try to do it here on the fly here and we did talk about planning <laughs> and of course we didn't really plan that out very well but I mean I, we can really take any instance of and I guess one of the we can start from from a be- a beginner standpoint so from a very be- beginning standpoint of if you are getting in, just getting into prep or survival or whatever you want to label it you know, this is a good system of understanding. We just started with number one, what is the problem? And that is what has gotten your attention and prompted you to start prepping? You know, what is the, the what is the big high level picture? Is it that an asteroid's on its way and well, we need to get cover, um, you know, or or is it the the zombie apocalypse has begun? And I think from there, you start to really understand and take ownership and get gaining a sense of control and clarity in what it is you need to do going forward. You know, as a new prepper, you start to understand, okay, here is the problem. This is, this is what's worrying me and this is what's getting me, or this is what's concerning me and getting me into things. And then from there, defining the causes. So, and this is where we can get into more specifics. So if you're a new prepper, we can take some of the things that are that are the likely culprits of getting people into prep today. And we'll just, we'll talk about economic collapse. I mean, we're not going to have a show about economic collapse. We're just using that as a scenario of that may have got somebody into prep. So if you des- you define it, okay, well, economic collapse, but when, you know, what does that mean? And you, I'm worried about economic collapse happening within the next five years, you know, and that would give you a, a, a real sense of what you need to do if you're a new prepper. Okay, well, if I'm worried about economic and uh, I'm worried that there's going to be that the the bigger problem of that the world is just going to come to end. Uh, you can really start working through things a little more clearly because it's there's probably not just one cause. I'm not saying that in the event of if you're a new prepper and in the event that you're worried about an economic collapse that you have to go so incredibly detailed in researching really every last minor nuance of what really is causing the problem. But if it interests you and you are serious about it and it really does worry you, this is another instance where you could actually dig deep enough to, and I'm not saying one way or the other about economic collapse here, but I'm just saying if you dug deep enough, you could end up finding information that basically debunks what you're concerned about. Now, hopefully that's, you know, at at that point, hopefully whatever it is has woken you up to the point where you're like, well, okay, now that I do see other things could be going on or, or really I'm worried about this over here. 
or whatever. But you start defining those causes. And then from there, you can start defining, you know, what you're going to do to fix it. And that for in that instance, it's like, okay, I'm going to start prepping. It could be as simple as that. Um, actually, I jumped ahead. Uh, but so to go to three as a new prepper, you would identify, you know, what will happen if you don't fix it. And if you don't fix it, it's like, well, you know, it could be as simple as, well, I'm going to end up hungry on the streets or, or I'm going to end up dead or I'm going to end up whatever you think will happen to you because of an economic, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to end up having to, uh, sell the tactical Weimaraner, or I'm going to have to prostitute the tactical Weimar on the street to, uh, to crackheads or something. I don't know. Pay the, to, 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 to buy dog biscuits. I don't know. Something, something, I'm just being (laughs) goofy here. Yeah. Yes. You're, you're gonna die. You, well, yeah, but I mean, it's like, okay, well, if I don't fix it, I could end up being, you know, beaten up by gangs, and all these other things, or you know, anything where you've identified, you know, kind of what the causes are going to be of, that and 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 what the possible outcomes of those causes. Um, and then I think we can go on to state uh, what you're going to do to fix it, mm-hmm. and that's where we can get into, you know, talking about, okay, well, to fix it, I'm going to learn self defense going to uh or actually we're talking about like big high level solutions it's you know we could it could be something as broad as i'm going to learn to defend myself i'm going to store food you know kind of just rattle off some very general things to give yourself a sense of where you probably go with this and not getting into the tasks um and if it was that it would be like we would talk about that you know probably need to pick up some self defense skills and and that i mean that could mean and we worry about whether that means martial arts or whether that means tactical firearms or anything else like that when we get into tasks. But then you would also go, okay, well, you know, I probably need to, uh, you know, also include in there that uh, shelter would be, you know, a good secure shelter and uh, having a bug out location and having enough food and water to kind of ride out the initial shockwave of the situation and, and giving ourselves a clear sense of, Hey, I'm new to prep and I need to go in this direction and this is what's going to happen if I'm not going to. And this is the big high level view of what I'm going to do. And then, and then from there getting into the tasks. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I need to do self-defense. And like you were saying a second ago, okay, martial arts, you know, and, and from there you could start in, you know, investigating out well, what do I mean by martial arts? And, and I think in that way, being really specific with your tasks too is really important because you could just say something as blanket as martial arts. You know, you could just throw that out there, but never actually do anything about it because it's like, oh, well, you know what? I just said martial arts. Maybe now I should actually try to go figure out what kind of martial arts I want to learn, you know, make it specific. Right. And, and you, you get that by going through this process. Yeah, you really going do. All the different nine steps. I mean, going actually through each one of these steps allows you to you know, actually define what you're supposed to be doing. It helps you focus on what, whatever the task is. That's really important, and it's easy to get caught up in situations. And we can even talk about the ammo scare. Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, God. not talk about it from a standpoint of news or anything like that, because <clears throat> there's really no news about it, um, other than just they're still not really there. I mean, if you don't have a clear understanding of ammo is really hard to find, it's too expensive right now, and what the causes are, and and really kind of going through that process, eventually you realize, well, there are the only task involved in that situation would be. I got to wait. Mm-hmm. I got to wait a year until it shows back up. Or you've decided it is such a serious thing that you're like, you know what? I don't care. I'll pay any price. I need to, I feel the need to get this much to feel that this problem is resolved. And at that point you can make those decisions But you, mm-hmm. you know, just scrambling around on the internet, like a chicken with your head cut off, looking for ammo and, and paying some ridiculous price for ammo when you don't actually, when you don't have a real impending need for it. Mm-hmm. Or when it's just not reasonable to do. I mean, that's the other thing you do going through this. I mean, because it could be that, you, well, you just flat can't afford to go out and buy a thousand rounds of ammo. At least not right now, because most of the ammo is really inflated mm-hmm. price-wise. I mean, I found, an example would be, I found 357 SIG and I saw it at uh, 79 cents a round. And I was like, that's a great price. Mm-hmm. And it was funny because, I mean, I was, you know, in that moment, yeah, it's a great price take us back a few years and that's like wow what are, you, are they gold-plated bullets <laughs> right are you are you are they silver-plated are you hunting werewolves or what are we doing here and that's not that bad oddly enough i've seen nine millimeter going for a lot more than 357 because it's not there 
But I think by by going through it and having a real understanding of what are the tasks involved and, and what all is needed to get into it, you would realize, hey, you know what, I, maybe I just need to put this on hold. And instead, I have this other, especially for new preppers, I think in particular, since that was the example we started off with and going back and saying, okay, well, you know what, I have this other goal and need that I need to meet, which is food. There's not like a big run on dehydrated food stores right now so if you were just wanting to get yourself up and running quickly and say you know i have the cash and i want to just be at 30 days tomorrow with my 30 you could jump on amazon or whatever and uh what was it i was on there goofing around the other day looking at uh was it wise food storage i think they have a thing like uh what is it's like 184 serving bucket uh, for a hundred and forty five dollars, and that 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 works out to uh, basically thirty days, thirty days worth of food. I mean, and that's thirty days worth of eating pretty well and having a full yeah. like three meal, meals a day and everything else. That's not even stretching it out, um, or anything else. And I'm I'm not saying why this is a great food or anything else. I'm just saying I was looking. I don't want anybody to mistake. It was not an endorsement for it. I have no idea if why is any good or not. Um, but I was just kind of walking through and I was like, wow, that would be pretty easy for somebody to, to quickly jump on and be like 30 days done. Um, and then getting on to copy canning or something. And so kind of getting back to the point, you might notice that, a- that filling that self-defense ammo need or something that, that goal, if that was one of your goals, you could quickly see that goal is not reasonable at this moment. And then you could say, set a goal of in three months, check back in on this. And see if we can at that point take care of it Mm -hmm. and then set a timeline for it and stuff and then jump onto food and then start taking care of food and doing those things which actually is what i really i bring that up because that's actually what i think most people should really be focusing on now which is you know if you don't already have those food stores in place or if you just had always thought of buffering it but buying the the ammo is more exciting than buying the bucket of bullets is more exciting than buying a bucket of ammo let's face it we're, we're men at least you and I are men here, and I think yes. we both have the bad habit of we'd much rather reach for the bucket of bullets than we would for food, which in reality, it should actually be the other way around. But the example would be this running through this might give you a sense that uh, hopefully it would give you a sense that, you know what, this isn't a good idea right now. I'm going to switch to this other one and I'm going to run through it. And clearly, you know, I, while this is going on, that gives, you know, maybe it's six months and you're like, you know what, within six months, I could get my food stores completely taken care of and be at a point where I'm comfortable with it. And I've got up to the levels I want to be at because you will have been able to have defined how long it's, you know, what you need and how long it's going to take you to do it and everything else. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think even in the more dramatic situation, you know, if we were talking about, I think you, you brought up like active shooter earlier and in an active shooter situation this is something, this system is something that, yeah, you definitely wouldn't want to sit there with a notepad and start writing this out. <laughs> but I mean, you know, going back to what you were saying earlier, like if you'd practice it, this is, you know, this is a system of understanding and clearly defining and thinking through things when you're in a situation where thinking through things is very hard to begin with. But if this is an innate, has you've done it to the point where this has become an innate skill for you, owning literally owning your survival of getting yourself out of the situation, understanding, you know, there's a shooter or or there's bullets flying at me. The cause is there's a shooter. Uh, You know, okay, I need to do this. I need to grab this person. I need to tell this person to do this. Um, And actually something, and I had it in the notes and I kind of skipped over it. The idea that assigning tasks to others and being able to give it to them in clear, simple terms actually came to me on the experience uh, when I was going through Red when you and I were going through, uh, because the last time I did it was when you and I were going, Jason, you and I were going through Red Cross certification. And one of the things they were saying was in an emergency, point at someone, call out to them and say, you go do this. Yes. And that's, you know, that's why clearly defining tasks for people and being able to say, you go do this. It's that same mentality. And while that might not be as crucial when you're talking about just planning out your food stores as a family or as a couple or as a pair of roommates or something, Having that innate kind of trained mentality so that it just becomes second nature when you are in emergency situations, that is something where you could quickly run through, define the task, understand the tasks needed, and start filling them out. You go here, get this person out of here. You barricade that door, or 
you know, you go open the, we're in a shopping mall or something. You go open that door in the back of the mall and get everyone out while I do, I don't know, while I throw feces at this guy or something. I, you know, I don't know, something. Uh, apparently monkeys were involved in that, uh, that mall shooting. It's that understanding that this, while this does seem very complicated and convoluted, or, or not necessarily complicated, but just very tedious in the beginning, it's that sense, and it's even like John Heatherly's survival template and, and his book, and when uh, and, he, and he was going through it, and he and I were talking, and I was reading through it and looking at it, and it was like, wow, this is a really neat map for thinking and running through things. And this is, in a lot of ways, very complimentary. To, to his great book and everything like that and and just a lot of the great stuff that everybody a, a lot of great thinkers in the community have done where it's being able to clearly define and understand the situation as you and i were talking about earlier about it, and, you know being situationally aware is understanding the situation understanding what's going on with it thinking in 360 degrees so you see in front of you to the sides and behind you as i said previously and really being able to work the problem and take responsibility for the problem. And that's, you know, and we've, we've always said that that is the real kind of invisible hand of survival chi is personal responsibility because all of this takes personal responsibility. I mean, actually making this system work, oh, you yeah. have to take the responsibility to do, to do it. it. Yeah. yeah. And the responsibility to, to run through these things. And I know you were, you and I were talking about like how much more as when you were looking at, it, you were like, yeah, this makes things so much more easy and clear to be able to run through a problem and work a problem and not feel, not feel out of control with it. Well, yeah, because I'm, human nature is we have a tendency to just put band-aids on stuff. Yeah. We, we you know, just, just, just slow band-aid on it and, and we'll take care of that again later. Mm -hmm. Whereas going through this process here, it, it allows you to understand what exactly what the problem is and actually fix it versus just throwing a bandaid on it and, and rolling through. Mm -hmm. And it, it gives you the time to, to really assess the situation and, and understand where exactly that problem is coming from so that you can really get down to the nuts and bolts of an actual real solution. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a, a, an excellent point of we, we are really bad because I think especially as we get adults and, you know, getting into trying to juggle so many things all at once. I mean, we're all trying to, you know, juggle, juggle jobs, juggle personal lives, you know, have a sense of community and connection with the friends we already have and making new friends and, and reaching out in the community and, and taking on that responsibility of learning new skills and acquiring more supplies and, and stuff for, for whatever we think may be coming next for survival. Um, and so often I know, <clears throat> I know when I first got in survival, I felt there was that initial shock of, wow, I thought I knew what I was doing and I thought I was prepared. And then it was that sudden realize okay, I am not prepared. I don't have a clue of what I'm doing. Give me, I, you know, I, I can go hang out with the Boy Scouts and go on a camping trip, but yeah, you know, something really severe happens. I, I, maybe I'd, you know, who knows? I might fare okay, depending on what the situation was, but not really do really well mm -hmm. um and and i and in most cases that's the goal of survival in general is to be able to get through a, a bad situation and a large part of what we talk about is you know making sure that you do things in the here and now that make your life better whether things go wrong or not mm -hmm. um and 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 you know like i said at the beginning this is something you can apply to everyday life and getting the practice with it and it is something that i mean I've personally found it, and I know the the people I have shared it with uh, recently in my own personal life, you and and a few other people at work and stuff have, have really found like, hey, wow, yeah, that's really define, uh, especially in really stressful situations, help me define things and do something. Um, but I think going back to talking about in the beginning of prep, um, which was just like, yeah, I just felt so overwhelmed. And I think if I'd had a clear, if I'd sat down and had a clear, I really needed to do. We were just kind of scrambling um, years ago when we, we all kind of, like you'd always kind of had a sense of it, but getting back into it and really getting serious about it and really taking, really taking the time to go through things. But we weren't really taking the time to go through things. It was literally like, okay, world's going to, not that we thought this, but it was that same kind of mentality and knee jerk to it. Like, okay, world's ending tomorrow. We need to, we need, we need tactical glasses and we need tactical clothes and we need, bug out bags and we need uh we need ham radio classes and we need all this gear and stuff and not really 
not really thinking through whether or not anything we were buying or doing was reasonable. I mean, part of it, we was having fun with it, but true, true. But the other part was, I mean, there is, there is certainly a lot of survival gear that I I mean, there's just, there's survival gear sitting around this studio. Now that I'm looking at going, why do I have that? (laughs) And and for God's sake, why do I have four of them? (laughs) But, uh, we did have a big shotgun approach from back in the day. Yeah, we really did that over the top. Okay. We have to be experts in this field, this field, this field, this field. All right, you know, you're learning this. Okay, hey, you learn this. And hey, you know, we need, you know, medical coverage. So we need a medical guy. And hey, Ron's a, an, oh, yeah, that, that one, that, that, he'll work for that, you know, that yeah, position. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it was a bit over the top, but I mean, it, I appreciate all that experience because it, it brings, it brings something really to the tra- table now. Yeah. You know, and since you started up the radio show and we, we started up the farm and all these other things, it really brings some, Hard, more hardcore experience to the table to understand really what the hell's important. Yeah, it does. And it's, you know, and I think that's, we've made a lot of big jokes out of, out of the farm. And I, and we've even admitted that we do <laughs> ham up our, our mistakes on the farm a little more than they've actually been. And part of that is just to be entertaining. Mm. But the other part of that is to drive home the, the sense of being diligent and really thinking through what you're doing and not really thinking through and not thinking through in the sense of over-engineering something, but really thinking through what you're going to do. Because, I mean, even with the farm, there's spatial things about the farm. And while I've obsessed over minutia, and there's areas of the farm where I've, you know, I'm notorious for over-engineering things on the farm, <clears throat> there's certainly bigger picture parts of the farm that had we sat down and really done this correctly... Uh, and really planned it correctly. I mean, we did a really nice job, obviously, apparently, according to animal control of, right. of setting all this up. And we have a nice setup. But at the same time, there are some real, a lot of it has to do with space planning issues. There's a lot of stuff that it's just like, you know, we should have thought that through a little bit better. Like <laughs> like the size and shape of our chicken coop is is just all wrong. And I look at it yeah, all the yeah. time. I'm like, what the what were we thinking? And we were just thinking, oh, we need a chicken coop. Well, we got these four by fours over here and we got, you know, let's go get some lumber and some screen and let's slap together a chicken coop. And the chicken coop itself was very well thought through, but it was not well thought through in a 360 degree perspective where we didn't really think through that coop in that space. Right. Um, yeah, as- there, we, we lost a lot of space around it and behind it yeah yeah and there's a lot of wasted space i mean yeah. it wasn't just that we lost it i mean it is wasted space. it's still there mm-hmm. so i mean i know where it went <laughs> it's just now we've got these like weird uh these weird areas on mm-hmm. either suit on either side and behind the coop that we can't use and the space has become so tight since the coop is at the very back of the farm and the cages all run alongside it now it's like we look at the coop and we're like man it'd be like surgery just trying to take that coop down yeah. and trying to put a new one in, oh, that's going to be a mess Yeah, because we're going to have to literally build the, walk all the materials because the, the farm is narrow and long. So we'd have to literally walk all the materials to the very back of the farm and put the thing together in place. Whereas last time we had this big open space and we just put oh, it yeah. together and like bragged the parts the big parts to it and then just kind of tacked it together in place. Now we're looking at going, oh, that was dumb. But I think definitely going back to what you were saying, as far as those experiences definitely have helped, because I mean, we, we can get on here and say, look what we did. I mean, mm-hmm. We're idiots. Look at what we did, you know, right, and right. here, here's how to do it in a more organized and school fashion. Um, and there's certainly, you know, there's there's several areas about like there's. You know, if we'd really thought things through, there was different like the, the tactical stuff that we that we all did was really great, but there were certainly there were other things that I would have actually rather have done. And there were other instructors that I would have rather waited and spent the additional money or just waited to when they had an opening or something done Mm -hmm. because uh, of just varying reasons. Um, You know, and I think that could be all kinds of stuff. I mean, that can be whether we're talking about tents, you know, I've got, I don't even know how many different kinds of stoves I have around here. And, and it was just like, Oh, that's neat. That's neat. That's neat. And you know, it's just grabbing indiscriminately. Like, Oh, I've got this, this stove hole I've got to fill for some reason. I don't know at what point in my survival career that seemed like a hole that needed to be filled by all these freaking stoves I have. Um, but I think part of it was just ooh, shiny fun. Um, <clears throat> that certainly could have been it. But even looking around the studio, I mean, I'm thinking there's like a giant tub of 
of retired survival gear. Most of it's like almost brand new. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, there's no reason for me to get rid of it or do anything. I mean, it's all good stuff, but it's like, it's all stuff that I'm like, I, why? I don't need this. Mm. It's just extra stuff. And while fun and sometimes entertaining to laugh at some of the things in that tub of retired survival gear, it's still like, that's money I could have put somewhere else had I actually been right, really thinking right. things through. And that's the whole point of the show, man, it is to, to let other people learn from our mistakes. Yeah. Like jumping yeah. in and getting all, you know, overly zealous and, and just being like, we need 20 stoves and we need you know, 300 firearms and 70,000 rounds of, of ammo for each caliber that each one of us has. And, you know, I mean, just, you know, so this over the top you know, mentality that we had, you know, initially because we yeah. were just in a panic and we we're just like, oh, God, you know, the, the sky's going to fall and the government's going to you know, take over and blah, 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 blah. And you know, now we're like, oh, man, yeah, whatever. <laughs> so, hey, man, you got some 22 rounds? All right, that's all we need, dude. We're good. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I think it is that. And I think it's the sense that we took ownership, but in a very, in the beginning, we took ownership in a very juvenile kind <laughs> yes. of panicky way, which yes, is just, yes. let's go buy lots of toys and let's just anything, any class that was within reasonable traveling distance and was what we could afford at the time. We were just like, it was never a question of, do I need to spend my time on that? Mm -hmm. It was always oh, there's a survival class, or yeah. there's something that relates to survival. Oh, I got to go take that. And yeah. it was never, is that a good use of time? Is there something else I could be doing? You know, or could I be focusing on something I already know how to do just to do it a whole lot better you know, and specialize in it um, and just things like that? And, and while, those, while there could have been not much different we might have done, I don't know. I mean, I do know there are certainly things that I could have done, but by not planning and thinking it through and just racing out and doing stuff, um, we were certainly a lot less organized and probably productive for the first couple of years that we were really all getting back into survival because most of us kind of grew up with the concept and grew up with the stuff, but really getting back into it, we did not have any kind of organization. Um, and some of the things that we did talk about and did try to organize were really looking back at them kind of off the back field. You know, do we need that class that, that what was it? There was a class we looked at, and I want to say it was like, now we didn't do this um, mainly because of the price, but it was like some school for like bodyguard driving or something. And oh, it was yeah. like $15,000 per person, and it was out, and uh, no, we did not go take that. I mean, I, I think if, if each that of us, fun, though, oh, it would have been hysterical, but I mean, <laughs> and each of us had, had actually been able to afford it at the time. We probably would have taken it. We, oh, I'm positive we would have taken it, but, you know, and looking back on it now, we'd be like, oh, how did I do that? Why did I spend that money, man? You know, you know, you look at it and you could be like, wow, $15,000. I mean, that's, if in general terms, something more important would have been at that time securing like a complete food storage for three years yeah and with that amount of money now uh, going back again i just want to reiterate we did not do that mm. but we had at that time had the money that that amount of money would have actually uh, i used to know this off the top of my head uh that amount of money would have actually bought enough food for four enough dehydrated food for four people for three years eating three meals a day and we were going to blow it on a six or seven. It wasn't even a six. It was like a four or five day driving for bodyguard course. I don't know. We were going to go defend Whitney Houston or something. I don't, I don't know what we were. What? I don't know what we were doing. I don't know. What we, I mean, I know what we were thinking. We were thinking it's like, well, that looks cool. Let's go do it. Okay. It's $15,000. We're not going to go do it. You know, thankfully we did not have the funds to go blow on it at the time. And there's, there's other things too. I mean, what was, we looked at the, uh, like the, uh, the author Neil Strauss of emergency, uh, wrote about those helicopters. And of course, as soon as we were like, oh, I didn't know there was such a thing. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know, we're looking at, was it gyrocopters? That's what they're called. So we started looking into that for a brief time. And it's like, all right. And then, you know, fortunately at that point it was, ex some of those things were expensive enough that it didn't require us to do any planning. It, we were stopped when, as soon as we looked up the price tag of the gyrocopter costs how much? Your pilot's license costs how much? I had them out. <laughs> right. 
the the point being just all the different goofy stuff. Oh God! We're looking at. I mean, I, we can sit here for an hour and run down the goofy crazy. We could. Stuff. I I was just gonna give the extra crazy highlights. Yeah. So. yeah. The the fortunate thing is those things were so expensive that we yeah. were stopped by doing it. But we could have we would have actually stopped ourselves sooner and not worried ourselves as much if we'd actually been systematically thinking about what are the you know what are the basics we need to get back to you know what what areas of our life uh, have we let go of as far as survival that we've gotten back into and really become interested in becoming really deep and really taking serious responsibility. Um, you know, aside from the goofy things that are contained within the bin of retired survival crap over in the over on the <laughs> shelf over there, um, you know, I mean, there's just just general wasted time and headaches, and you know, I mean, I don't think I actually regret anything we did. No, no. But I mean, in part because we did it as a group, and we all had a lot of fun doing all of the stuff that we did, um, and all of the stuff we talked about doing, and all the stuff we still talk about doing. I still enjoy it. But I think the difference is now we do with. You know, even before really having a really defined system of taking ownership of, of these different things, we started to have an understanding of what are we doing? Why are we doing it? What is the problem? What are the causes? Okay, fine. Let's, well, that sounds crazy, but we'll have a conversation about it. You know, what are all the parts involved in it? How long would it take? Um, I mean, obviously, if there's money involved, and there usually is, you can add in what the costs involved. And I left that out of this this discussion today since to try to keep it away from its original intent, which was really for like office environments. And stuff. Um, and, and so, but adding in a line about, you know, costs involved certainly be put in, mm -hmm. uh, if you want to refine it even further. Um, because, and, and that gets into, you know, talking about budgets and everything, which we've never done a show on and probably will never do a show on, uh, budgets really. Cause there's so many really just great podcasts out there and other stuff and so much information about there already about doing budgeting. That, yeah. So as a listener, you can go figure that one out. Um, that, and I don't want to be, you know, liable for that kind of information because as soon as you start giving financial information, kind of legally funky. Right, 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 right. But anyway, hopefully that that has uh, today's show has given you some some food for thought and a what is actually while it sounds complicated, we ran on talking about it for a long time here. What is actually a pretty simple system for understanding taking ownership and doing something about the things in your life that you're worried about, whether it's survival or, you know, whether it's just an issue at the office. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And with that, we wrap up episode 99. Thank you for joining us today. Get weekly updates about articles, episodes, and special in the rabbit hole announcements every Saturday morning by signing up for the newsletter through the website in the rabbit are you part of the solution? Spread the word about preparedness by reviewing In the Rabbit Hole on iTunes. It doesn't just let us know how we're doing. It also tells others the show is worth listening to. Review us today on iTunes. From the Lone Star State, till next time, stay safe and sound. <laughs>